For those of you who don't know me, I'm Joan Lancourt. I'm the board president of Company One, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Clearly, um, our idea that you know this was a conversation that people were interested in is true, um, and uh, I think that you know given what's going on now in Boston with Boston Latin and all over the country. You know, there are clearly a lot of difficult conversations that we need to have about race, about class, about gender, and a whole host of inequities that are literally tearing us apart. Um, you'll forgive me, I'm not a stage person, so I'm going to use my notes um, to put a little context and frame around this evening. Um, Company One's founding mission is based on the belief that theater, both on stage and in the classroom, are powerful tools that can be used to further the cause of social justice. We've always focused on telling the stories that aren't being told and giving voice to those on the so-called margins and by helping to create new narratives. This kind of theater can expose and explore issues that are really at the heart of those difficult conversations. In fact, it can do more than just facilitate those conversations. It can give us a set of tools and experiences that can help us take effect, more effective action to end those inequities, most of which are held in place by institutional structures and systems that pervade our daily life. Besides the obvious entertainment value of our shows, and our current production of An Octoroon is a perfect example of that. Theater on stage and in the classroom can do four crucial things that really enable more effective activism. First, it increases awareness. With live performance in a room with other people, we can experience profound emotions and we can be challenged and provoked, opening us to new insights and new awareness. And second, in the classroom, with that new awareness, we can engage in those difficult conversations, exploring and deepening our understanding of the issues um, that we learned about on stage, and that we can also begin to identify the systems that need to be transformed. And third, in both the theater and the classroom, we are in face-to-face -face spaces with others we see that we're not alone in wanting things to change. And that helps us find the courage to make those changes, to take the actions that are required. And finally, though these share, through these shared experiences, we begin to understand that to build the civic power required to transform institutional structures so that they support equity rather than inequity, we really need to take action together. That's the connective tissue that threads through performance to classroom to activism. And that's the conversation we really want to begin tonight. How can we think more broadly and more intentionally about how to use theater on stage and in the classroom to increase the likelihood that after the show, and after the classroom, and after those difficult conversations, people will come together to make the changes that we want to see. So to that end, we're going to hear first from James Millard, one of Company One's fabulous teaching artists and an alum of the Boston Arts Academy. Um, <laughs> yay. Um, and then our apprentices are going to share a piece of their work with you. Following that, Mark Vanderzee, uh, a Company One founder and our director of education, will moderate the panel discussion. And we've scheduled a good chunk of time so that you will have an opportunity for Q&A. And finally, Linda Nathan, a prominent educator and C1 board member, yeah. um, will make some closing remarks. But before I turn it over to James, I really want to thank the, some of the key board members and staff members who literally have burned the midnight oil 
to make this evening possible. So thank you, thank you. And James? Good evening, everyone. I'm not going to use the mic. I am a stage person. And to start the evening, we are going to get up and warm up, as we would do for any theater class. Um, the purpose of us warming up is to, <laughs> the purpose of us warming up is to get our bodies loose, to set the energy. We do that also to build community with the students, uh, to set rapport. It serves a variety of purposes and reasons. But tonight, I hope that it just gets us in the right mode, shake, loosens us up, and gets us ready for the conversation for the evening. So um, the first exercise that we're going to do uh, is we're going to just simply just stretch up. We're going to stretch up first, right? Everybody's going to stretch their hands and get on their toes, get on your toes, and reach up high. And you're going to act like you're going to twist two light bulbs. You're twisting up two light bulbs on your toes, on your toes, and you're just moving. And you're just going to let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. And then we're going to just go into what is called a shakedown, right? This is how we perform a shakedown, OK? We're going to shake our right hand, and we're going to count to eight, like this, one, two, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, we're gonna repeat that. We're gonna do that with the left hand, then we're gonna do it with the right leg, and then we're gonna do it with the left leg, and then we're gonna do it with our hips, right? We're gonna count down from eight in half to four, and then from four to two, and then from two to one. When we get to one, everyone, when we get to one, we're shaking it up. What we're gonna do is we're gonna jump up and slap high five to the person next to you. So whoever's next to you, right? You gotta get ready, you gotta look them in the face, right? Get a bit, look them. Look them in the eyes, look them in the eyes. So get ready, get ready, get ready. Right, and we're gonna get ready to perform this shake then, okay? So let's start with the right hand, left hand, le right leg, left leg, hips, okay? And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 one. Hey! You should feel warm. You should feel loose. You can shimmy it out. Shimmy it out. And to bring it home, we're going to just breathe a little bit to focus, shift the energy for the evening. So we're going to take three deep breaths. On the third one, we're going to hold it for 10 counts before exhaling. We're going to inhale through our nose, exhale through our mouth. And on the first one, everyone ready? Deep breath in. Exhale through your mouth. Deep breath in. Exhale through your mouth. We're going to hold this one. Deep breath in. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Release. And give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> We're going to keep this thing going. Next up, we have our C1 Education Associate, Fran. Let's give her a round of applause as we welcome her. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Fran Dasilvera. I'm an education associate with Company One, and I work with our out of school programs, which include the professional development for actors class. That is instructed by two of our board members, uh, Ross Thomas-Clark and Victoria Marsh, who are both here. Um, and I also work with our production apprentices, these lovely four people. Um, we partner with the Department of Youth Engagement and Employment to employ teens from all over Boston, both during the school year and in the summertime. We hope to expose these teens to what it means to work in a professional theater company and um, also to help, um, 
help them with engaging not only with or arts organizations, but also with community partners. Um, our team started in December and already um, they have prepared, planned, and hosted a community engagement event at the Dor Dorchester Boys and Girls Club. They've also done a ton of workshops already with Company One staff, um, including our street team, our marketing team, um, and they have also been doing a lot of activities about what it means to work in a professional setting um, and how best to collaborate and work with one another, which are skills that we think is very important to start building um, as early as in high school. Um, they've been doing a lot of wonderful work so far, um, and you guys are gonna get to see a little bit of that tonight, but I'm gonna stop talking so they can take it away. All right, hello, my name is Arit Green. I am a junior at Newton North High School, and this is my third year in the apprenticeship. Hi, my name is Emma McDonald. I'm a junior at Stone International, and this is my second year as an apprentice. Hi, my name is Eric. I am a junior at Soden International. Um, this is my first year as an apprentice. Hi, my name is Kanisha. I'm a junior at Tech Boston Academy, and this is also my first year as an apprentice. One of the first things we did when the apprenticeship program started, we was reading an actor room. Actor, after we collectively read the play, we discussed our feelings and thoughts, as well as the different themes of the play and how we connected to the characters. The two characters that we felt most relatable to our society were Minnie and Dido, two slaves who were best friends on the plantation. They were the inspiration for community engagement event for you that we hosted at the Dorchester Boys and Club um, on January 16th. Like Minnie and Dido reflected on the difficulties of 1859, we reflected on the notable news and social issues of 2015. We did this through the lens of social media because we feel like our generation has a voice and where many of us get our news today. <laughs> we began the event with three short videos to ensure the youth at the Boys and Girls Club to an octoroon and challenge them to creatively express their thoughts and opinions. Please enjoy the videos that we, the apprentices, collaborated on. The first is a mini and Dido performing their last scene together in an octoroon. I'm worried about you. Why? I think you can get too worked up over the small stuff. Stop being so sensitive and caring so much what other people think all the time when you go catch yourself a stroke for real. You can't be bringing your work home with you. Why did Zoe's light-skinned ass want to call you old and poison herself over some white man that you need to let her do that and move on? She's an adult. You can't change her. Shit! Same thing with Mrs. Payton and Mrs. Gar and Master George and Master McCluskey. I don't know these slaves and everything, but you are not your job. <laughs> Got to take time out of your day to live life for you. Get ready for your life to change. 
change. We got to be on a boat in a minute. And that may not be heaven, but it sure as hell different from this here swamp, and that's got to mean something. The next video is our reaction to the Minnie and Dido scene. Someone come get that. <laughs> Real talk. She sounds crazy. She wants to get a new life. Ha ha ha. <laughs> what? <laughs> guys laughing? Because she can't. She can't get a new life. <laughs> like, if you're not being a slave, then what exactly is your job? Alright, we get it. You're not Manny. What does the man mean? You know, like Aunt Jemima? Oh, you mean like that grandma from Little Bill? Aren't they really going to be leaving on a boat? There's still slaves on a boat. They're going to still be mopping up crap. Does slavery not work on water? What did they think was going to happen? And they can't even leave. Why is she lying to her friend? Has she not been a slave all her life? But is she lying? Maybe that's what she think will happen. <laughs> no, she said, we'll go on this boat, have a drink. Well, like, what drink are you going to be having? Are they going to be drinking the swamp water they're cruising on? <laughs> Not necessarily. It isn't going to be leisurely, but life might be better. They're not just going on the boat. They were sold to this guy. Yeah, but at least they won't be stuck in the plantation. At least they were on land on the plantation. I was just around At there. least they got to travel around now. It's not like Celebrity Cruise Line. Yeah, but we don't want to be stuck in your house your whole life. Well, yeah, that would suck, but I wouldn't try to convince myself nor my best friend that living somewhere else would be better. Yeah, but they were moving around. It's not about the boat, it's about the fact that she's trying to convince herself that life is going to be better. It's like being on the bus, but the bus keeps moving. Yeah, but you'll get off the bus eventually. They're not, not getting, getting off, off the, the damn, damn boat. boat. You're gonna have a dream? Of slavery? No, to be free. I mean, she can dream, but what good is that doing her? See, this is a problem with our generation today. Please tell me what the problem is. Actually. Do you agree with this? Thinking everything sucks is okay sometimes, but some great things happen this year. Some bad things happen this year, too. Yeah, but if you keep holding on to the bad things, you'll be able to grasp the good things that happen. Even though they're about to lose everything and they're still slaves, they still have hope. And each other. That's too much right now. But you're right. New year, new me. <laughs> and finally, Minnie and Dido's reaction to our reaction. <laughs> Whose kids are these? Hmm. Somebody needs to come get them. I don't know. I think they made some good points about what we're going through. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Where did they get off talking about 1859? I like what they were saying about... But they don't know what they're talking about. First of all, they weren't born yet to see what happened. They don't know our struggle. But that doesn't mean they can't connect to us. How can they connect to us? They're just kids. They might just be the kids, but the struggle is real everywhere. Especially in 2015. Girl, what do you know about 2015? Girl, this is theater. Time doesn't exist. Mm. That still doesn't give them the right to criticize us for having hope for a better life that has nothing to do with being a slave, you know? They should be thinking about their own lives. It's not like 2015 went off without a glitch. Mm. Bill Cosby, eh? Tamir Rice, mm. Donald Trump, need I say more? Well, maybe their experience is what caused them to criticize us like that. Mm. They don't want to focus on their own lives. Well, maybe they should start to focus on what's happening around them and not what's happening to us. Slavery might not exist, but social issues still do. Exactly. So, they should reflect on that instead. Stop hating on us and do something. <laughs> Girl, we gotta be out. Massifano's here, you, you vlogging, you know. Oh, get it. real talk. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that the apprentices themselves wrote the scripts for those videos, so. Everyone should have a list of topics from 2015 on their clipboard. This includes Donald Trump, hashtag Black Lives Matter, gun violence, and Planned Parenthood. With the youth, we had them create an art piece in order to respond. They made t-shirts, wrote poems, and drew pictures. We're asking everyone here to choose a topic from the list and tweet your response. If you don't have a Twitter, on the back of your list there are 140 boxes that represent 140 characters. <laughs> Make sure to tweet at hashtag Real Talk with C1. We'll give everyone a couple of minutes to do that. Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, we're doing it live right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you, um, we gave this list to the boys and girls um, at the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club, and we went through the list and had a really great discussion about how each of these were significant to them. And then they chose one and created some kind of creative response. Um, so we're asking everyone here to choose one. And because we don't have markers and paper for everyone to color on, um, to tweet your response. So, uh, yes, or a space or. I don't have Twitter either, Phyllis. It's fine. We'll be compiling this into a Wordle and sending it to everyone after the event. I want to thank you guys for participating in this activity. And next up will be the panel discussion. And to introduce the panel discussion is Education Director Mark Vanderzee. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, give another hand for Fran and our apprentices. Uh, uh, if you have completed your tweet sheet, I call it, I'm not on Twitter either, uh, but um, if you have finished with your 140 character response on the yellow sheet of paper, you can just pass it down uh, to your, pass them down to your left, uh, and uh, actually pass them down to our right, because they're over there, and Fran will collect them, uh, and we will try to get them posted in the lobby so you can take a look at uh, how people have responded um, after the event. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for coming out tonight. Um, I want to echo Joan's thoughts about how important of a conversation this is. And we at Company One Theater are so excited to um, welcome a panel that has a broad range of experiences and points of view, ones that, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but um, I'm a theater person and uh, I kind of don't like talking to other theater people. So um, I'm really excited. Uh, that uh, Matt Gray, who is on our board, uh, put together this fine group of people that are here to talk with us today to convene this conversation and start it off. We're going to be spending, I have uh, four main questions before I welcome them up. I'm just going to get to some business stuff first so that you're not distracted by all of their beautiful faces. Um, so I'm going to ask four main questions of our panel first to begin the evening. And then really the meat of it is to open it up to you guys. Obviously, this is a huge topic. These are huge issues, uh, impossible for us to address in an hour and 15 minutes in a really 
uh, comprehensive way, but hopefully we'll get the conversation started tonight. So while we do have a, a, a stopping time tonight, we really understand and welcome uh, the conversation to be continued afterward um, in further events at further productions, however you want to be communicating with Company One Theater. So, um, so thank you. And without further ado, oh, so Eric, who has been with us for three years now, as he mentioned before, is going to be co-moderating with me. Um, so uh, we're psyched about that. But I'd like to welcome Kendra Tyra Field, Summer Williams, <laughs> Caesar McDowell. Tracy Strain, and James Malord. As I alluded to before, um, these are fascinating people. We've gotten the chance to uh, chat with each other a bit in advance, which is exciting. Um, and they're fascinating people, but instead of me telling you all about them, we've printed bios in the program, so you can take a look at what they do, because we want to get right to it. Um, so without further ado, um, we're here, we're here, and welcome. Um, so while some of these, uh, speaking to the broad perspectives at the table, while, while the articulation of these questions, uh, you'll see theater, you'll see education mentioned in, these question, in the articulation of these questions, but again, we are really um, thankful that the folks on this panel are able to speak to a broad array of experiences and to explore the connective tissue that Company One Theater really is, uh, uh, really is all about trying to find that connective tissue between uh, ourselves, each other, different communities. So, um, so we know that attending a live performance can open up people to new perspectives, right? New emotions and new ideas. It can put you in the shoes of whatever we might consider the other. It can challenge your preconceived notions. Post-show conversations happen. They've become popular. But what happens after the audience leaves the theater? What has to happen for an individual or an organization to translate that emotional and intellectual experience into actions? that have the potential for making an impact on social equity? Huge question, right? Huge question. Because they're so huge, we're gonna put them up on the screen here so you can keep them in your mind as we start addressing them. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over, I'm gonna open the conversation up uh, to Kendra first. Great. Um, so, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, Mark asked me to talk a little bit about the play in particular. How many of you have seen the Octor or an Octor? Okay, great. <laughs> um, so um, I wanted to talk just a bit about it. I'm a historian, a uh, historian of slavery and the post-emancipation period. Um, and in my own work and my writing and also in my teaching, I rely a lot on stories, a lot on narrative. Um, and that's not always the case for historians. For me it is, I was talking to Summer before um, we came over here and um, you know, I said I actually hated history all the way through high school, um, <laughs> well into college, because uh, I just, I didn't quite figure out until pretty late in the game that the stories I heard from my grandmother were also history, right? That even though um, you know, the little box we would get on slavery or the Trail of Tears in a textbook, and this is in the 80s in New Jersey, um, was right there, I didn't connect the stories I heard from my grandmother to the kind of big um, abstractions I was getting in these textbooks. And so what really pulled me in is when a kind of light bulb went off and I realized that the two were um, deeply connected. Um, and so um, I should say my, my grandmother's stories were largely about growing up in the all black towns of Oklahoma. Um, and they were about black and native and multiracial and white communities um, that didn't conform to any kind of uh, bi racial binaries that I was growing up with in, you know, New Jer northern New Jersey at the time, um, and were quite, quite different. So my uh, grandmother's grandparents were born enslaved, and um, in particular, were the, one was the child of an enslaved woman and an slave-owning man. And so this kind of complexity 
that I heard stories about growing up and again didn't have a, ma a kind of match for uh, in my own learning process growing up stayed with me. And so what I'd say about the play, uh, it's a, play, a really powerful reinterpretation for those of you that haven't seen it um, by uh, the African-American playwright, although we would trouble that, that category, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, uh, of a pre-Civil War, eve of the Civil War, um, a reinterpretation of this eve of the Civil War play by an Irish playwright originally, set in antebellum Louisiana, and involving quite specifically, liaisons across the color line, right? Even as it contests what that color line meant. And so I do this a lot with my own students. I think about, um, uh, I talk about how we can both understand uh, race to be kind of constantly shifting, a kind of moving target, very malleable if you look year to year to year, how how um, racial categories were defined, and yet racism to be also real, right? And to hold those two in our heads at once. Um, the kind of constructed nature of race, and at the same time, um, the powerful um, impact past and present of racism, right? Um, and so, um, I guess what I would say, I loved watching those clips that the, um, that the interns um, shared with us, and the response, and then the response to the response. Um, and I, I just felt like uh, the play, it reminded me of what the play did for me, and what narrative and story does for many of us, right? Which is to open up, to break open the abstraction of uh, slavery or quote unquote the slave, right? To see what does it mean to be an enslaved, what did it mean to be an enslaved daughter, sister, mother, brother, husband, right? Um, what, did the, what were the particularities, the individual experiences, um, the individual ways that people navigated these systems quite differently depending on who one, what one person's um, individual subjectivity was. And to me, that's really the power of narrative and it's the power of this play um, to open up those conversations for all of us in the present. Thank you, thank you. Um, I also would like to turn it over to Tracy who also has really interesting connection via uh, her work to this question. So, um, hi everybody. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker and at the moment I happen to be working on a, the first feature documentary about Lorraine Hansberry who, as most of you know, <laughs> is best known for writing um, A Raisin in the Sun. And so when this question was brought to my attention, uh, it made me think about the fact that well, first of all, our documentary is looking at Lorraine as an activist artist, and she was somebody who um, you decided to use art, her words, theater, as her vehicle for her activism. And uh, so when I saw this question, and um, knowing all the things I know about Lorraine Hansberry, it was really interesting to think about the fact that the response to Raisin in the Sun wasn't what Lorraine Hansberry expected, and um, it, you know, it didn't really help. It didn't cause any major changes. In fact, in many ways, a lot of the people who came to the play, who were white, um, it kind of reinforced certain ideas that they already held about, you know, this notion of the mother, the mammy. Um, many of those women in the audience may have had black maids at home. Um, in terms of identifying with the characters, it was interesting to see that people did identify with the story of the younger family. They were rooting for the younger family not to take the money. They wanted them to move out and take the home because they really were, it's the first time, it, historians believe, it's the first time on the American stage that white audiences really identified with black characters. But what happened as a result after that, a lot of the uh, critics and uh, who talked to her would talk about how universal it was and they said, well, this isn't really a play about a black family because, because they could identify. And that, I thought that was really interesting that just by identifying with someone took out the race of it. And yeah. Lorraine was really strong about saying, this isn't, this isn't just, this isn't, a universal play. This is a very specific play. She has this quote about, in order to reach the universal, you have to be very specific. And she said, this isn't just a Chicago family. This isn't just a black sh Chicago family. This is a Chicago family on the South Side. And, and so um, I, I, um, I think that she spent most of her life trying to figure out ways to get people to take identifying with other people and translate that into action. And so hopefully, you know, when you see our film when it's done, um, you'll get a, a larger sense of that story. 
Awesome, and, and so I, I wanna take it, and I'll open it up to the entire table at this point to, to address the last part of this question, which is, yeah, the, the, there's impact there, but, but what do we need to do as individuals if we feel compelled? How do we, how do we take that next step? How do we, to, one, once we leave the theater, once we leave the performance, once we leave the film, what, what's gonna get us, what's gonna get us there to, to take action here? Sit in silent. In action. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I want to try to say something about that. Um, not being someone someone who's not in the theater, but thinking about kind of kind of moving outside once one has this, you know, been exposed to something, have a sense, of, you know, an experience that really generates empathy for them. Uh, what do you do with it? And I actually think sometimes we make the bar seem too high. Right, we are asking people to take a particular experience and then apply it in some kind of significant phenomenal way. Hmm. And I actually think it's wrong. Uh, that we actually need to think, I actually like to use this term, uh, I use it kind of in a, as a contrast to, you know, uh, microaggressions. I think the, the thing we want people to do is actually think about what are the, what I like to call the micro inclusions. Mm -hmm. What can, by having an experience in something, actually change the little thing that you can do that actually allows you to recognize your humanity in another person. And sometimes we, we make the bar so high that people begin to kind of become paralyzed in their ability to act. To act. You know, so for example, that one of the things I found myself doing, even in my own teaching sometimes, is I might be working on a concept around something and I may have people discuss it, but Often what I'll do is I'll turn to people, well, first, explain it to me in the language in which you feel most eloquent, first, mm. right? So you understand it for yourself, and then translate it for us and give it to us. And that little act, the little act of inclusion is basically saying to someone else, the place where you come from originally, the language that you hold originally, has value, mm. right? It has a place here, right? So I. I just cautioned about wanting too much and not creating opportunities for people to realize the small acts actually mean something and having permission and the space to create those. Any other thoughts? Yeah, go, Summer. I would just say very quickly that there's, I think, an opportunity for whatever the institution or organization uh, that is involved in presenting also has a responsibility for helping to not tell, not teach, not guide, but say, and this could be a thing, this could be a way that you become personally active. That's not necessarily prescriptive and not necessarily about an individual working against the mountain, but in this interaction on your tea ride home, think about this and how do you weave it into your daily life? And I think that's a part of that um, for Company One Theater that kind of post-show interaction where people have a chance to maybe not say it nicely, maybe allow it to be messy, but to work through it in a way that feels significant so that they're leaving with something that they're going to carry forward personally. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna start, so, so I don't know if many of you have been to panels before, but often panels start with the details and then end up like really big picture, leaving everyone with big picture. We're starting big picture uh, and we're, we're working backwards. Um, so we're actually, that was a, that was a huge question. Um, so when we go, when we, as we move forward, we're actually going to get into some more specific, uh, uh, specifics and, and more detailed work. So uh, Arik is going to open us up for this next question that starts to focus us a little bit more. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, so this next question, uh, focus to Summer first and then we'll pass it on, and it talks about rather than focusing solely on the craft of theater in specific courses, how can we use theatrical art of creative storytelling of the creation of new narratives so that students can, collaborat can collaboratively <laughs> engage in the struggle to redress the inequities of race and class and gender? Thanks, Eri. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm of two minds. I think when we talk about the craft, that's 
that's weird language, um, in terms of thinking about facilitating or, or teaching a way to do something. And I think there's definitely place for that, but I also think more important than that is kind of getting, getting it to happen organically, which it will, um, and then ultimately being able to say, and this is the thing that you're doing, right? So you don't have to kind of go in with the knowledge of understanding an element of this craft in order to be a part of the doing of it and then having it expressed to you later. I think sometimes where we get hung up is, um, I'm gonna use a metaphor that might be bad, so just go with it. Um, <laughs> if, if you're trying to teach someone a, um, a math concept, right? And they don't have the, the ability to understand the concept, but you break it down to them in a word problem. And they're able to understand it in the context of that world, word problem where there's a real everyday practical application. And then you're able to say to them, look, what you just did here is actually called this. And so you understand the concept, you understand the doing of it. You just need it to wrap your own frame around it for you to get it. That, to me, feels like the work of the teacher and the work of what needs to happen in that classroom environment. We have to kind of allow the individual, the student, whomever, to come to their own understanding and then give them language so that it's common and we're all saying, and this is a part of this craft. And this is the thing that you've already demonstrated. Um, and you don't have to understand the term fully in order to see how you have been able to do it to start, because I think in the, for me, uh, if I feel like I don't understand the concept or I don't get the languaging of something, I might get hung up there and miss the opportunity to just engage. And we don't ever wanna be uh, in a space where we m allow students or individuals to miss the opportunity to engage. Uh. <clears throat> Caesar had some interesting thoughts about this on our phone call, and I see you nodding your head vigorously as Summer yeah, was, was talking. Yeah, so, was, um, th those were my thoughts. But, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, well, th actually, uh, and just just listening to this again now, I'm actually thinking about something different. That is about what is the place of narrative and storyteller in life, mm -hmm. and and if folks have that craft and know how to actually bring that out in other people, it's really important. I actually think that one of the things that happens, in particularly in the context of marginalized communities, however you want to define those, is one of the key marginalizations that happens is to marginalize people around what they know, right? So basically tell them constantly they have no knowledge, they don't know anything. Mm. And that continually happens by basically saying uh, you don't know how you you don't have knowledge because you can't express it this way. It's the same mm -hmm. thing you were saying. And in actuality, what we know is true that most human knowledge actually is expressed narratively, mm -hmm. right? It actually doesn't. It's not expressed in the more formal ways we do things, but it is actually through stories and narrative that people actually construct their understanding of the world, share the knowledge that they have about it. And somehow, I think one of the things we've managed to miss, right, in our, in our society uh, is the power of those narratives and those stories and how we need to hold on to them and how we need to encourage them. So I actually think what comes out of people learning how to do that and how to support others in it is actually an incredibly important part of any liberation struggle, right? Because if folks can't own their own narrative and their own story, uh, then they actually, they're not free enough to engage in actually making something like democracy work. Because what they are basically doing is hiding themselves, right? And if members of the public are hidden from each other, then you can't have a democracy, right? And the pathway through that is actually people being able to have the ability to kind of name their own story, their own lived experience for themselves first, and then being able to do that with others. And I think the stage represents a form of that, seeing how that can be done. But in actuality, it needs to be taken out so that people are actually doing it on the day-to-day -day all the time. And 
us not getting into the space where we kind of hide our stories, right? The complex, and the st our stories hold the, the complexity of everything. And the push, you know, today is to simplify. But in actuality, people's understanding of the world and people's lives are not simple. Mm -hmm. They're highly complex, right? And they hold that complexity all the time. And part of what we're able to do through, I think, working with narratives and story is actually shine a light on that complexity and not kind of allow ourselves to be persuaded by the idea that we have to come up with a simple narrative uh, as the thing to solve, but it is the complex narrative that we need to be dealing with. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, yeah, that was really so powerful listening to, to both of these comments. I just wanted to add, um, in, in terms of the classroom, one of the things that I do with my students is you know help them facilitate them essentially to writing their own family histories. And um, I taught, I was in California the last five years, and so when I got here teaching at Tufts, I had a lot more students that came from like kind of the um, Eastern uh, quarter and, and many more students that came from the US South. And uh, I was teaching a class on slavery, slavery and race in the US, and I realized on the first day that about half of my students either came from the South or within a generation or two had come from the South. And so I had some students who were writing about their slaveholding ancestors and had you know, reams and reams of you know, wills and transfer of property, including human property, maybe other people's ancestors. And then I also had a number of students writing about their enslaved ancestors. And, um, and I very often had students that said, but I only have this little bit of information. I only have this little part of a story. I don't have any paper. I don't have any documents. And um, so, you know, really my kind of central commitment in teaching family history over and over and over again and in making, all, making kind of writing about one's own family an option in every paper, and every assignment, right, is the kind of commitment to showing, right, by doing um, over and over again that it is possible to tell these stories, right, and that there are different kinds of evidence, different voices, and getting those voices and evidence into the mix are what actually moment by moment, you know, creates these kind of um, small openings. I liked that word that, that you gave. Um, and, uh, and then putting those two or three or four individuals together in a group um, usually in pairs. And I often would put someone who, uh, who writing about her slave owning ancestors next to someone writing about her enslaved ancestors next to someone who's writing about both within the same family, um, which is more often the case um, than not, as the place, you know, play reveals as well. And um, then get them to talk about the kind of unevenness of the quote unquote archive, right? Like, what do we have access to? Who values what? What does paper mean? What does it mean to your family? And then helping them find a piece of paper that actually was there all along and what that means, you know, in the context of a family, I know what that meant to my own family to see a document, right? Um, but I think there are so many ways that we can kind of um, essentially use story and storytelling to and use people's own stories that are right there waiting you know, for us. Um, I'd like to add, um, in my own experience as a teaching artist in BPS, <clears throat> I find that um, students who get to tell their own stories tend to experience for the first time, at least <clears throat> in my experience, ownership in a way that they haven't had before. And <clears throat> it creates room for these students to make connections with other students who are so different from them, whether it's their race, whether it's their gender, religion. And those connections, <clears throat> those connections allow room for people to, who wouldn't have at all um, collaborated with each other or um, found room to, to create more conversation or to <clears throat> just grow together wouldn't happen. Um, it's, it's crazy how many times I've seen students relinquish <clears throat> so much pain, um, so much pent up energy, thoughts that they've hidden from family and friends and they've been able to express it in a story, um, sometimes in front of peers that they really don't know anything about. And, um, and it's powerful, it's, it's, it's transformative. And if anything, it opens up doors that wouldn't unnecessarily be open if not through that avenue if not through storytelling and being able to share that with peers. Um, so um, it's, it's a barrier breaker in a lot of ways. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, so 
Um, that being said, we're going to launch into talking about Boston specifically a little bit here. And uh, we know that there are multiple efforts going on in Boston right now to build deeper relationships between live performance theater education and the communities in which those performances take place. And the question here is, what more could we do to increase the use of live theater and the related educational programming by the communities themselves as they struggle with the contentious problems of race, class, gender inequities? Uh, I'm going to turn this, uh, I'll, I'll, launch, I'll throw this right back to James, actually, as he had some pretty strong thoughts about this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I think it's important for, um, I think it's for, important for people who have access to venues, space, who have access to resources to create their own productions, um, to come into the communities <clears throat> and help be a resource for those who know nothing about that and, and are not necessarily, um, <clears throat> are not able to get that. Um, I think it's important for <clears throat> myself and others like who have who have the 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 ability to 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 go into the community and share what they have, share the knowledge that they have, um, to do that. And and I think that will I think that will open up some pretty basic opportunities for people who don't know that they have them. Um, and so I think overall, those who have access, those who have resources need to find themselves in the communities without that access, without those resources and sharing them and, um, and doing it any way that they can, um, especially when it comes to theater, you know, so. Great, thank you. And, and uh, Kendra, I'm gonna turn it over to, to you actually, because you had some thoughts about this as well. I think I actually said what, <laughs> what I was going to say um, in response to this one in terms of the use of storytelling and, and family stories in particular in the classroom. Um, I guess I just might add that um, because I think it shouldn't go without saying that, you know, there are many reasons why we don't tell some of our stories, right? Um, and, you know, in my own, I think a lot about the late 19th, early 20th century, post-emancipation period, what we think of as kind of freedom's first generation. Um, we're talking about deep, deep legacy just a couple of decades after this play, right, of, of um, sexual slavery, of concubinage, of, um, and then of continuing um, sexual exploitation. So I think, you know, very often in the early 20th century, for instance, my grandmother's sisters who were growing up in the 1910s um, would never s really talk about um, a lot of what had happened, a lot of what they had experienced for, for different reasons, right? So I think there's actually a great complexity to um, both the stories we tell and the stories we don't tell and, and what, get, what remains behind. And I think, um, you know, this play is so powerful and, and um, in, in large part because it kind of lays bare a lot of, a lot of that stuff that later gets buried. Yeah. And uh, Tracy, if you, if you don't mind talking a little bit about your work in relation to this, I think it's really valuable perspective. Sure, I had the uh, great privilege of working at Blackside when Henry Hampton was alive and um, worked on the series, I'll Make Me a World, A Century of African American Arts. And I, did, I produced two of the programs. And one of the things that happened in conjunction with the series that was a six part series is that there was educational materials and outreach created. So it provided a really great, um, a, t a training ground and uh, gave me a lot of ideas for moving forward when I, you know, with my own work when I started making my own films. And one of the things that happened, um, one of the connections that was made was with Artists for Humanity back in um, the night, it was like 1998, 99. And the students from Artists for Humanity uh, made uh, images that of different uh, people profiled in the series. And even then, I did a little segment on Lorraine Hansberry. And so I always remembered this little square that was created uh, about that with Lorraine Hansberry's face on it. And it was made into, they took all of the squares of different people and made them into a poster for the series. And then on the other side, there was a teacher's guide. Anyway, so fast forward to uh, two years ago, and we're launching a Kickstarter campaign to raise some money for this documentary. And I, 
I, li I live and work, I live in Midway Studios and Artists for Humanities now is just up the street. And I thought it was a really exciting opportunity to revisit them and check in on the little Hansbury Square. And, um, and what we ended up doing with them is um, they found this square and they created um, Kickstarter rewards for our campaign. They were some of the high-end rewards, you know, handmade art by uh, high school students. Um, and they, in addition to that, we went up there and interacted with the students, talked about Lorraine Hansberry, provided materials. Um, not They didn't just make the Hansberry squares, but we also talked about the south side of Chicago. We picked places where Hansberry lived and, and um, worked, and so we talked about the south side of Chicago. We brought materials for that. We talked about um, Greenwich Village. We talked about Harlem, and we brought imagery and, and things for them to read. We even They even incorporated pieces of the actual um, play into some of these montages that they made for our Kickstarter rewards. Uh, they also used that Hansberry image to create a t-shirt as part of our rewards. And so we're really, we were really excited and um, to work with the students and we look forward to continuing moving forward with some other ideas that we have to um, further um, open our place up to them so that they can, there's video, videos that we hope they will be able to create and, and other materials. Cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah I was go just gonna uh, add um, <clears throat> about the power of story in kind of public policy issues and when you're trying to deal with issues of race and stuff like that. Uh, we just, and you know, you can take a really boring subject like transportation <laughs> uh, which a lot of people don't think is boring. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time working on it because it's absolutely extremely important, right, how people are able to get around the city. And um, our organization um, has been involved for the last year helping this city of Boston uh, really implement a different kind of community engagement process around transportation planning. And one of the key things we've done in this in this effort is really to bring artists to create opportunities for people to construct narratives in very different ways. And one of those, uh, sometimes it's not just can someone tell the story, is can we actually follow a person through their story, hmm. right? So one of the eye-opening experiences we did for folks that became part of the campaign, and you can actually see it at the Go Boston 2030 site, is this whole thing of having someone from the transportation department actually take a ride and follow the commute of different kinds of people, right? That experience is not someone sitting down telling the story, figuring out how, how to tell the story, but they are embodying their story through what they do in the day to day. Hmm. And sometimes, you know, we, we uh, what makes these issues so hard to bring forward is we are translating the visceral right, into words, into other kinds of things. But it's actually being in, mm -hmm. the, living the story mm -hmm. for a little bit of time that makes it so much more powerful. And sometimes makes it for the other people, <laughs> folks sometimes who, I should be careful. I want to, when I say other there, I don't mean other in terms of racial stuff like that. But I mean people who are like struggling to figure out how do I take this complex issue of race and then think about it in a policy framework mm -hmm. or consider it. Sometimes it's hard for them to actually you know, grasp that and understand it because they don't have experience with it. So it's not enough to just give it to them cognitively, right? And sometimes it's not enough enough for them just to kind of have an emotional response to it, but sometimes it has to be an embodied experience that then really triggers something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, theater plays with all that for the person who's on the stage, but I think they can take that out so that people are having all three of those kinds of experiences. And that creates a different understanding of the issues. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I think James and Caesar bookended the, the, that their responses to this question in a way that's going to lead pretty well into our 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 last moderated question, and then we'll open it up to you guys. This question, this last one, is really meaty, um, and uh, I'm not going to turn it over to anyone in particular. Uh, this one is going to be more conversational and hopefully lead to uh, conversation from, uh, from everyone 
here, so, and maybe in the Twitter sphere and online, wherever they're watching from. So, Rick, take it away. Uh, okay, so the question is, what role does structural racism and institutional white privilege play in deciding the content of temporary performance, the theater curriculum, and in turn, the cultural conversation? Yes, there are lots of groans. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Well, we're uh, having this conversation, so I guess that's what role it plays. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> we actually have to have this conversation right here, right now. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a major part. And again, as you know, someone who's not in the theater world, I just kind of think about it in other realms. Is it is the substance of the American experience, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you cannot go anywhere, touch anything in this country that's not tainted by racism, mm -hmm. right? Everything you do has that in it. And the question so much isn't, you know, how does it, right, uh, well, we, how do we, you know, how do we deal, uh, what role does structural racism and institutional white privilege play in deciding contemporary things? I mean, it, it I like the way it's uh, phrased because it, assumes that there is a role, right? So the role is there. It happens all the time. Uh, the question for me is really more about, uh, you know, how do we shift that role over time? What is it going to take? When does it become such an urgent issue that it's, uh, we can't be gentle about it and we need to be forceful about it? And when is it something that we need to kind of just let go? It's like, what is the equivalent of the, the kind of beautiful, uh, multi-faced strategy of Black Lives Matter, how does it actually manifest itself in all kinds of other places, right? So what does that look like in the context of when one thinks about theater? Where is the place in which we have to stand up on the stage and take over the performance versus we have to be within the, you know, the broader dialogue around it? Uh, I actually think, in, particularly in other medium forms, we are, things have gotten kind of pretty bad. Right? I mean, it's pretty scary now what is acceptable public discourse in this country. Uh, things that maybe people would have thought and not said five years ago now feel very free to say uh, and to actually push even further. So in this end, I think we've kind of passed the point of kind of being gentle about how do we respond to these things and we need to be really forceful and aggressive around them. Because I think it's we're in a really dangerous space uh, right now. Uh, and, you know, kind of some of it's humorous. You can look at it and say, oh, that's humorous. You know, like, you know, there's a white guy playing Michael Jackson. You can do a lot with that. You know, there's a lot of double meaning in that whole concept <laughs> <laughs> that one could play with. But the actual, you know, but what, do, what the hell does that mean, right? And there's all these struggles, I think, that artists themselves you know, are, are dealing with, right, about how truthful can artists be, right, particularly artists of color, in both naming something not only for people who are part of the pressing, but also naming something for the community itself, right? There are these just huge, incredible fault lines in the conversation that are out there. You know, I think of someone like, uh, like Lupe Fiasco, who's doing some really kind of interesting work, right, around you know, like his, his song, uh, Bitch Bad, mm -hmm. which is really, I mean, if you listen to it and you think about it and watch it, he's, he's threading that thin line between what we own, our identity, the uses of language, what does it mean, you know, and, and this, you know, what, what does misogyny mean? And, all, and he's dealing with all that in his song by really playing with the things that we think we shouldn't play with, right? And so I think the creative, world of artists has a lot to offer in disrupting some of this stuff. Uh, but I, it's, we need more of it. We need more and more and more of it. And I, I think the arts in all of its form have the ability to liberate us from some of this, but uh, we need it because I think where things are going is incredibly uh, frightening, you know, from my standpoint. I think they're just frightening. I might add that not only do 
we need the artist and we need the art, but we also need the right people to consume it. Yeah. Um, so what I find tricky in the, the question is that the, the role of the structural racism and the institutional white privilege keeps a lot of the progress at bay, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By way of the art is there, there are people who are doing it, there are people who are fighting against it, but the people who actually need to be a part of those conversations that are a result of that art are choosing not to engage with it in several different ways. And so what is the work that's being done not on behalf of the artist and not on behalf of the art, but on behalf of those who need to be forced into a space of discomfort in order to, in order to start writing some of the, the wrongs, um, for lack of a better phrase. And that's the question I, I feel like I am personally wrestling with, I think wrestling with institutionally, um, because there's, a great value in continuing to, you know, push the envelope and to continuing to uh, just kind of dropping off the edge of the cliff to see how far down things will go, right? But, but at some point, at some point, that pushing and that pulling is not going to be enough because you're pushing and pulling with the same people. Mm -hmm. And if you're pushing and pulling with the same people, how do you then engage those same people to bring with them people who might have the difficulty, who might really feel disturbed, um, who might really need the conversation afterward? Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but that's the role I feel like. It, you know, like I'm fighting in, I'm fighting in opposition to it, um, but my work is not with the art. My work is with the audience. Mm -hmm. I'll invite everyone to address this. Um, <clears throat> I, I personally, uh, I work with uh, Arts Emerson, I work with Company One, and <clears throat> I see firsthand how um, these, ki these kids from the inner city, um, when they get exposed to theater for the first time, how deprived they felt, feel for being, you know, for not having access for so long, you know, for being 15 and 16 or 17 and going to the theater for the first time and knowing that this was, you know, the Paramount Theater was right down the street from Downtown Crossing every day and for some strange reason, all the schools that you've been to, nobody has ever taken you there. But, you know, for some strange reason, when you're talking to the kids from, you know, no offense, Newton North or something like that, it's like, oh, they've been going to this theater that's in your backyard since they were four. And you kind of feel like, wow, you know, that kind of sucks for me. Um, you know, and so it, it there is a, a, a real life impact, you know. Um, I think it's important for, <clears throat> you know, to stick to, I don't want to go on tangents, but um, <laughs> <clears throat> I think it's important for us to acknowledge the fact that there is institutional white privilege and, and I mean, institutionalized racism and white privilege and that they, play a direct effect to the classroom. When, when students in BPS do not get exposed to the arts because it's the first thing cut, when other schools and other places are getting it from first grade up and they feel like it's a necessity, and you're telling these kids who don't, cannot identify with geometry and you know, uh, social studies because it's whatever, you know, but you give them a Lorraine Hainsbury play or something that they can identify with, but they don't have that opportunity, it's, it's impacting them. It's, it's, it's taking away from their experience, from their growth, from their development. And so, um, you know, if, if, if the, <clears throat> a lot of times I like to say people who are benefited, who benefit, the benefactors from white privilege or institu institutionalized racism, um, they don't, beside having a conversation, that's how far as people are going to go, you know? And so it, it's not gonna be anything, any direct action unless those who are in this room who can, who are part of this conversation and can identify with the realities and the truth of this, go and speak out and do something major about it. Go 
be intentional about doing something about it and not simply talking because when we talk, we continue to have the structural institutionalized racism and white <laughs> privilege and you know, we go home feeling like maybe this was great for conversation, but I gotta go back to the schools where these kids feel like they don't have the same access or resources or anything that other people are having, that they see clearly. Don't think that the students don't see it. They see that they are being uh, treated like second class citizens even in school from sixth grade on. Maybe not first or fifth grade, but you know, they get into secondary, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, ninth and up. They, they absolutely can identify with being second class citizens in just school, not at the workplace, not you know, with the authorities at school, with the many, you know, from the theater point of view, you know, not, no shame, not trying to cast um, anything on anyone, but white 30 year old females that go into the black, all black neighborhood to teach these black boys and you're expecting them to have a real life experience and they cannot connect with this 36 year old young white woman who, God bless her heart, because I have spoken to her and I know her heart is sincere <laughs> and she wants to be part of the change. But for some strange reason, these boys, the barriers, the experiences that they have, they do not allow for her to penetrate that experience. And so, you know, when, when the institutions that have the, the, the resources to send these people into these communities are only sending people that they know are coming from certain places or you know they're not necessarily reaching into the communities and pulling people who are on the streets and grassroots shout out to Arts Emerson and C1 for doing that right <laughs> but um you know then then there's not any real change or impact and that just sucks because then people like me and my students just know it just sucks and that's what we're left with <laughs> you know and so um that's what that is <laughs> Um, I would just quickly add that kind of connecting with what you said, but in a different way, it's really important for people who care about change to support projects, whether it's theater or filmmakers or other creative endeavors by literally supporting with money. It's like none of this stuff is going to change unless we who care get our friends and, and um, other people in our networks to support projects. It's like we have to go to the opening night weekends of films that we believe are important. We have to support plays like Octoroon and other things. We can't just say, oh, it was great, that happened, I'm so happy to see it, and then never take the time to actually go there, buy the ticket, and then you know, encourage other people to do the same. Mm -hmm. I also would encourage people, the only th way this is gonna change is if you literally do check out these Kickstarter campaigns and Indiegogo campaigns for not just big projects, but smaller projects to help foster new generations of people who are trying to tell narratives that haven't been told before. It's really challenging. Like when I think about trying to convince people that a documentary about Lorraine Hansberry would be important, it's been surprising to me that it, I've been working on this for almost 13 years to like prove that there's value in this story. Mm -hmm. Um, even somebody who's as, you know, even someone with a story, I mean, a piece of art that's so um, well taught across North America um, still was problematic because her story, the, the depth of her story is hardly known. She's just perceived as an icon. And even me trying to prevent, pr provide new information about her and explain why this woman who is, you know, black, young, female, secretly a lesbian, um, uh, se secretly a communist, all these different things that are, like most people don't know about her are part of this story and, and her, her words and um, the issues that she faced resonate with people today. And young people, whenever they find out about her, they're so excited and sort of stunned that they don't know anything about her. But the gatekeepers, for whatever reason, maybe I wasn't expressing myself well enough, did not seem to un, you know, get that. And so it's really important for other people to, who value things like a Lorraine Hansberry story or a play like this or Company One, um, to really come out with your pocketbooks and, then, um, and, and show people, because then once once people feel like, oh, okay, people like this, this is, oh, I 
oh, but they're interested in this, then they send, tend to come around. You know, but first we have to like prove to them that this is worthy. And so it would be great if we got past that point and we just like supported our own projects. Yeah, I, I just think that would be a, a, a helpful thing um, for all of us, so. Sure, I'll, I'll just say very quickly, um, I think it's just so, when we think about institutional racism and privilege and, and what roles they play, we're also talking about what role history plays, right? What the proximity of the past, how close it is. And I've, I, I found a couple of quotes from um, Brent, um, from the um, playwright here, and then also from Al Borders, who played Minnie, right? And, she, and so I'll just read this from Al Borders. She, she said, I'm occasionally frightened by how accessible some of this is for me. Some of it feels like things that my great-grandmother went through when she was sharecropping in Alabama. Um, and um, of course, the playwright talks also, has talked also um, about his own upbringing and going back and forth to his grandmothers in, in Arkansas. And so, I mean, for many um, storytellers, for many people, period, right, and especially African-American people, we, we're drawing upon um, stories that are very close, right, very close, and we can pretend in abstractions that they're, that they're in some distant past, but we're just talking about a few generations um, in the context of this particular, the legacies of slavery, for instance. Um, and, and lastly, I guess in terms of stories, some stories have more power than others. And stereotypes are big stories with lots of power and wealth behind them, mm -hmm. right? And that's why it's so urgent, and it's so urgent that we tell our own stories and that we have you know, diversity of representations of what it means to be anything, but particularly what it means to be black today in America um, or, or in 1859. Yeah. Thank you. At this point, we'd uh, like to turn it over to you guys uh, for some questions or thoughts that you have. We do have two microphones, one stage right and one stage left. Uh, if you'd like to come down and share your thoughts there. If you're in the middle of the room and you feel like it might be too much of, it would be too disruptive to, uh, to stand up and start to try and scooch by people, you can raise your hand and uh, we'd be happy to repeat your question. Um, and then if, if, uh, if we don't capture it clearly enough, you can feel free to correct us, but, uh, but we'd be happy to have you. Yeah. Summer, I, I, as the director of an Octoroon, here at, in this very space, running for the next three weeks, <laughs> but, uh, might you want to might you might you uh, want to comment on that? Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there's definitely commentary that I don't want to give away because it's very very loaded. Um, so so. Um, the Octoroon, Dion Boussico, was considered uh, abolitionist in nature uh, when it premiered. Um, and there were certain things that were very unique about what he was doing as a playwright at this time, as an Irishman who uh, came over and spent time in Louisiana on a plantation. And uh, there was this very popular book called The Quadroon um, at that time that he kind of pulled text from and then went to the plantation and did all this kind of research. Um, so the, the, the advent of the camera was a huge, fascinating piece of technology. So where people were coming to the theater and they were seeing this camera work on stage and the camera is uh, an integral uh, plot point in terms of something that happens. That was kind of mind blowing because it was something people hadn't seen before and eventually something that people would have access to. Um, one of the things I kind of liken it to is you know what does that mean for the theater today? And it would be like you know watching a hologram concert of Michael Jackson and Tupac like in your seat right there, right? Um, just like too big to imagine. Um, that's how it felt for audiences then. Um, 
an, another thing that Dion Busico did at that time that was, it's problematic, but it's also, it was revolutionary thought was, um, you know, at that time, any, uh, any person of color, i.e. African American, black person, um, indigenous American was played by a white person in paint, right? Busico described the color. So in his notes on the play, he would say, um, Dido, a honey colored girl, uh, a high yellow woman of 30, a dark black strap man of blah, blah, blah. And even listening to that language, I think I see on your faces like, oh, that doesn't sound good. That doesn't <laughs> sound right. But at that period of time, that was revolutionary thought because what he was implying is that there are many different types of what this brown skin means. And therefore, there are many different people. And it's not just a singular um, experience of slave. Um, so even though it's tricky and wrong in a lot of ways, it was still progressive for its time. And I'll, if anyone else, if anyone wants to riff at any point, just jump in, jump in there. Great. Anyone? Yes. <laughs> you know, a rant with a friend too also, but I find myself being exhausted by this um, and not having money to donate to you because I'm still sending money to my family in the South, right? <laughs> it's like these many layers of success as a black person um, who's trying to give in many ways, but how do you maintain and sustain and answer these questions ongoing? Great. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to I'm going to echo that last question uh, just for those folks who might be listening who are not in the room um, and who didn't catch all that on uh, over microphone. No, no, it's rich. It's rich stuff. Um, but how do you maintain? Uh, how do you maintain the stamina to keep going, to keep moving forward, while maintaining your health, uh, both physical and mental health, without just throwing your hands up in the air, getting too pissed off, or just throw, you know given up. Is that, did I capture it? Yeah, that's great. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I'd start off by saying, um, I, first and foremost, uh, it's, 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 it's more than a passion for me. So my heart is, is truly dedicated to the work. So yes, I have my times where I'm truly exasperated and these kids get on my nerves and oh my gosh, I got to do another lesson plan. No, you know, but um, um, I think having the right team of collaborators, I, I work with some pretty awesome people. Shout out to all of y'all at end. <laughs> I work with some pretty awesome people who are able to help me sustain the energy throughout the ups and the downs and, and all the trials and in-betweens. Um, Without having that network of support, I don't know if I would be able to continue at the pace that I'm going. 
So that's, that's, that's a, a huge anchor for me. And then um, uh, secondly, I would say um, you got to have fun, right? Like these people that we are trying to impact and, and, and trying to help transform their lives or, or help them to lead them to transform their own lives, they need to see us living our lives in a real way. You know, and I tell my kids often when I'm having a shitty day that I'm gonna have I'm having a shitty day, but we're going to change and shift the energy because just because I had this moment beforehand that might have sucked doesn't mean that we can't have an awesome moment right now. And and so when they see that and they experience that, when they come through the door and they're like, Mister, I've had a shitty day. Can I say shitty? Yeah, oh. yeah. Oh, I mean, whether or not you can, it's oh it's God. you've done it. Sorry, you've done um. it. <laughs> Good job, James. Yeah, I just realized. All right, anyway. Did well, HowlRound throw a rating on this? But, um, Is that, are we okay? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, but when they're able to see that, they, they're able to draw from that experience and, 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 and own it themselves. And, and um, I think that's, that's why we do this, right? That's why we do this, for those small rewards of seeing somebody's life actually changed or transformed by what we do. And so I don't think there's ever going to be a time in your life where you're not going to get exasperated and want to throw your hands up. But, you know, you just got to have the right people in your corner and know why you're doing this. So, Yeah, I would say that knowing why you're doing it is is kind of the key um, through all of the um, ups and downs. I, I think that for me personally, when I, I think about the fact that the reason I decided to make this film wasn't really anything to do about me. It was about the fact that when I was introduced to Lorraine Hansberry when I was 17, when my grandmother took me to see To Be Young, Gifted in Black, I saw someone who truly inspired me and I couldn't believe I didn't know about her. And I thought back then, wow, people need to know about her because there was someone I could identify with growing up in the suburbs of um, central Pennsylvania. And, um, and so years later, all these things happened and um, um, and then I end up um, deciding that I want to be a filmmaker in part to make a film about Lorraine Hans right now. It's hard to believe that I actually am making that film and a film hasn't been made before this time, um, given that I first saw that play in 1977. And um, so I think about the fact that there are going to be other people when they learn her, Lorraine Hansberry's story, that other young women especially will be inspired um, by that story. But in a more practical um, level, um, you know, I just, I've learned the hard way. Like last year, I didn't take care of myself and I got really sick. And, um, and so now I'm trying to do better and get exercise and do all the things they say you should do. And I'm actually trying to do it and it's kind of, it's kind of working. <laughs> uh, I think we're all crazy, <laughs> which helps. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know how else you go on if you're not in this world. I mean, this world will make you crazy. Um, I, I think this is actually one of the, I think you've raised an issue that for me is really a real challenge in the work because uh, the story, at least, I'll, I'll, I'll make it very personal, I, I won't generalize. I can look at my own life, my own family I grew up in. So I grew up in Colorado and Louisiana, back in Louisiana, every summer, rural Louisiana, whatever, different time. And but the narrative that was woven through my life, through church, through school, and everything else, is lots of people have helped you get to this point. Your job is to help lots of people yeah. get to the next point. Okay? Now we uh, did that in the, that story was told to me by everything around me that had a contained, integrated system in place to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And we carry that load now without that system. Mm -hmm. And I think it is killing us. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know how to say it's a little bit too much. I can't do all that. I can just do this and be okay with it because we know the consequences sometimes of not doing are sometimes horrible. And so 
being in this situation, I find myself sometimes realizing, you know, choices would seem sometimes seem like even small choices don't feel like real choice. Let me put it this way. The cost behind each choice does not seem appropriate for sometimes even what the little choice is. It seems like it carries so much more weight around it. You know, it's like, no, I'm not going to go to that event at that school and see the kids. Well, that's not just about me saying I'm not going to go because I'm tired. It's about setting up a whole bunch of people for disappointment. And do I want to carry that disappointment, right? So this is actually, I think, one of the things about privilege, right? <laughs> privilege, when you have privilege, you don't have to carry that, right? There's a little more balance between the choices you have to make and the cost behind them. And when you don't have it, the cost behind the choices, even small choices, can be really heavy. And so I find myself sometimes, I know I do more than I should, and in doing more than I should, I don't necessarily bring the quality of what I could to the things that I do, and I have to live with that kind of imbalance. Yeah. So I don't always feel like I'm bringing my best self, yeah. you know, to things sometimes. Uh, I find myself sometimes like I really admire, I used to be a musician, and I remember when I was in my musician space and I was focused on music, I knew how to bring my best self to something in that thing. But then I was just like not paying attention to a whole bunch of other things, mm -hmm. right? And I was at a time in my life where I could get away with that. I learned more, did more, and realized, boy, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think the answer for me, and I know for other people I talk to, it's really hard, right? It's, it's, it looks on the outside as if we don't, and I think, let me say it another way. I think for someone like myself, you know, I've managed to have a lot of opportunities. You know, I come up from a family where the, my father was functionally illiterate. He worked in a, you know, meat packing plant. My mother was a nurse's aide. I was the first person to go to college. You know, we lived in poverty, but moved up to middle class because there was a union, you know, and things that allowed some opportunities to happen in my life. And I managed to kind of go through a lot in my education and have lots of kinds of opportunities that I managed to kind of get into, you know. Uh, and you notice how I talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I managed to get into it. You know, mm -hmm. the, not a lot of agency in that, is there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there is. But there was, right? But, but that's me and not how not to hold the narrative. I, I guess the point I'm really... The point I'm really trying to make in saying all this is that I just, I think we, ca I carry, and I think a lot of people like me who feel that we can't let go, we can't stop at certain times, but when we do, often, sometimes it's abrupt. Mm. <laughs> sometimes it's not done in a way that really is supportive or helpful of the other things that you're in. Um, you know that ability to say no in a way that is about no ahead of time as opposed to no at the, toward the end because you're totally exhausted and the other person's going to feel sorry for you. So it's okay then. Right. <laughs> I don't have to carry that burden myself uh, and the loss that goes with it. So there's a, there's a whole lot in it. And I just think as black people, we, this system around us has in some sense burdened us with a lot of stuff that we don't know how to talk and support each other around. Uh, that, that makes it hard. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I just like identify with it a lot. And you know, wish I was a little crazier sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because I embrace that side of things, because then you can feel like, okay, I can just, you know, act this way, do this <laughs> thing, and I won't have to worry about the, you know, the kind of consequences of it. So. Yes.
heard tonight sharing what they experienced on the stage. Um, I don't think we realize how strong this power is. And I thank you for reminding me to use the word power. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to, I just want to say those really quickly. So a, a debt of gratitude for the term uh, micro inclusions, but also uh, sharing the space and sharing our voices with the entire room and giving us access. Uh, and then, uh, yes, yes, go. Great. Great, and then uh, kind of transferring from, uh, thank you for, for those thoughts, so transferring from micro-inclusions to macro-inclusions, uh, suggestion that uh, folks might be able to stay in their own communities and make a difference that impact the whole city, not just stay in their own communities, but make a, make a difference in their own community, mm -hmm. right? Um, and three examples being, uh, there is a plantation near Tufts uh, also, the Boston Common, which had historically yeah, let's talk about the it. Royal House um, at, at Tufts. Historically, uh, annual celebrations of black presence on the Boston Common, led by King Dick. Um, and uh, then the North End is the first, first settlement of the black community in Boston and, and the potential of uh, theater having an impact uh, in those places citywide. Yeah. Cool. Can I take that? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. 
Oh, so I just wanted to um, respond to that. I'm so glad you asked this question. Barbara, is that your name? Um, so, um, for, for multiple reasons, but one is that we've just launched, I'm the director of the Center for Race and Democracy at Tufts, and because I'm a historian of slavery, what we've done this year is we've launched this big project on the public history of slavery and freedom, particularly in Medford, right, because there, some of the history is covered with the you know, African Meeting House here, and then out in Concord there's the new Robbins House um, Museum, but um, the Royal House, as you mentioned, is five blocks from the Tufts campus. I take my students there um, every semester. It was land that became part of um, Tufts, or, or sorry, that was, Tufts University came off of the Royal Plantation initially. Um, Related to that, um, we're, uh, we're kind of trying to connect uh, both the history of slavery at the Royal House with um, a broader history of African American uh, African American communities in that um, community. So, for instance, the West Medford Historic African American Community that was established shortly after the Civil War um, by former slaves moving northward. Uh, and also um, a number of other sites. Uh, so I believe so powerfully in the power of place-based learning. If you are anywhere where you can take kids out, take them out and unpeel these, let peel back these layers because there are so many and it's so powerful for people to feel this is my place too. Um, so, so depending on, uh, we have a question over here, and depending on, from Matt, and depending on the the breadth of the responses, this one uh, might be our last question for the evening. Um, understanding that, of course, there are many layers to peel back, and we're only scratching the surface here tonight, but hopefully leading to uh, further things. So, uh, thank you. So, there's so much that upsets me about Oscars so white. So much, but I want to focus on the thing that got me as a holder of a British passport. Is some of the most offensive stuff that came out of the mouths of white European actors: Charlotte Rampling, Julie Delpy. The fact that it's Joseph Fiennes who's going to play Michael Jackson, and Michael Caine. And it causes me to reflect on: Is there? A, I sense that that happens on a broader scale. That theater in Europe does that to us in America. And I say this is not even being an American. And so my question is, is what role is history and how theater and history is playing effectively a Michael Caine or Charlotte Rampling telling us what our history is and how, and appropriating it and owning it in a way that we're not. And so can we get past a world where theater history is the cradle of history is the cradle of civilization. It starts with the Greeks, who stole it all, and stole it all from India and elsewhere in the world. Yes. So, so a small question. <laughs> yeah, that one may end up being our last one. Or maybe not, you've stumped them. <laughs> the, so the question is, um, if I may, the question is about, um, does, do we have a, to what responsibility does theater have in, um, in, in kind of stripping away the, 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 this cradle of civilization identity that we, you know that 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 we tell in these stories, and and how can we give credence to uh, uh, to all stories? Am, am I am I getting am I getting that, Matt? Right. So, how can how can the American theater transform um, or or take ownership of, of that in a, in a way that um, that that European theater seems to have owned that process? That's a great question. <laughs> Here you go, folks. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, yeah, Barbara, Barbara. Barbara's got the answer. For me, the way that... Uh, Hold on, Barbara, because uh, I have a feeling that... Uh, oh, no, I'm taped. Thank you, my okay, I'll walk up to one of the mics. <laughs> oh, no, 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 please let me walk up to it. Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the ways in which, or in actually the primary way in which uh, American theater and European theater um, claimed supremacy over theater was to take over um, and claim the history of the Greek theater. And you, you had mentioned that. They, uh, they connected up to the classics. Uh, and also beyond the classics, the, the second phase or the English phase was through Shakespeare. Black theater, when it was trying to establish itself, went back to Shakespeare. So you have the African Grove in uh, the 1820s in New York doing Shakespeare. You have King Dick, whom I mentioned earlier, doing Shakespeare at Broadmoor Prison um, in England. Um, and successively, as uh, black theater performers tried to establish themselves as privy to the universalism that Greek theater supported, they also worked with Shakespeare. One of the things that's not quite so known, but could be an entree uh, and something for all of us to pay great attention to is that the Greeks uh, drew a great deal of their myth from Africa and from Egypt. They were translators. They were not originators. So if we pay more attention to the original role that came out of Africa, we can do a great deal to transform American theater and talk about universi universality in its actual roots, mm -hmm. rather than its borrowed roots. Thank you. I would add that there's something to me about remembering that theater as we know it is a gift of colonialism, right? And so as a gift of colonialism, one of the things that it um, made theater in this country was um, something for the privileged and not for the people. Mm. So figuring out now in 2016, wherever you live, wherever you're working, what are the institutions that are really about serving the people and not serving the privilege? And that's the way to, I think, possibly think about dismantling. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to take a moment. I know, I know, there's a few more hands, but we've we've got to um, we've got to wrap things up for tonight. Again, uh, understanding that this conversation is just beginning uh, here, and uh, we hope that you will continue to have conversations like this, like this one with us in the future. I'd like to take a moment, really quickly, to thank um, Arts Emerson. Who, uh, who we are partnered with on an Octoroon, but also this event tonight. Uh, so uh, I wanna say a thank you to Arts Emerson and HowlAround, for, um, for, which is housed here at Arts Emerson uh, and uh, is a theater commons f uh, worldwide and uh, their participation in live streaming this event. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the Company One Theater staff, the Company One Ed staff, Fran, Peter, and Nikki, for helping to, uh, for, to, for helping to make this night possible. The Company One Theater uh, teaching artists, uh, one of whom you heard from and saw from today, but uh, we have six others who are out doing uh, yeoman's work in the city, working with uh, high schoolers in the city. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Company One Apprentices, Arik, <laughs> Kanisha, Emma, and Eric. Uh, so thank you to the apprentices. Uh, in this program, um, you'll see that we've listed some supporters of our education programs, the MCC, Bank of America, the Boston Foundation, the Boston Cultural Council, uh, Social Innovation Forum uh, and Edvestors working with uh, BPS, uh, BPS Arts. Um, so thank you to all of our, the supporters of our, Edve of our education programs. And um, I'd like to thank the board, Matt, Joan, and Linda Nathan for um, helping to really put this night together for us. And with that, I will turn it over to Linda Nathan. Thank you.
And thank you to this amazing panel for really spending some time with us thinking about all of the issues that I think at the end you all were just beginning to get warmed up about. My job is the money. Now you heard this panel, you heard two of the panelists talk about how important it is. It doesn't matter if you can give $5, $50, or $500. What matters is that you give, and that you give because you care about what company one is doing. I cannot begin to express what it feels like to me as the founder of Boston Arts Academy to have one of my former students, I'm gonna cry, on this panel. So for all of the students at Boston Arts Academy, Company One has become the professional theater that they can graduate to. If you haven't seen an Octoroon, you must come. You must buy out the house. I had the privilege of seeing it in Brooklyn, and I can honestly say, and I said it to Summer, this production is better than New York. Yeah, Boston, we can do better than New York. So there are brochures outside. Come to an Octoroon, support Company One, be a member, Dig deep, we need your donations. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, have a great night. <laughs>